How much did you raise? Down payment plus closing fee, carrying cost plus renovation, right? Yeah, I think it was 1.3. Very <laughs> first deal, 1.3 million yeah. dollar raise yeah, between yeah. between Very cash and leveraging HELOCs and yeah, and that's and that's the beauty thing. Like the whole network is your net worth. I couldn't have done it without all these people and. Hello everyone and welcome to the Property Hustlers Show. My name is Andrew and today Ping and I are joined by a very special guest, Andrew Cowie, who is a serial entrepreneur, a real estate investor, as well as a coach, a real estate investment strategist for anyone looking to get into real estate and scale their portfolio. So Andrew, really great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, boys. I appreciate the invite and I am happy to be here. First of all, I want to get the conversation started off with a few things that you've been doing because Andrew flipped a property in Toronto and he raised all the capital cash new investor, you know, where he was working a job prior to this. And I feel like there's such a good story there. And I'm like, how is this guy doing this? So Andrew, tell me a little bit about that, because I feel like that's such a good story for anybody who's looking to get into real estate. Yeah. I mean, I got the real estate bug started 2019. I got to a seminar. One thing led to another. I eventually decided to get educated. So I joined a community with uh, real estate education. Within that community, I was talking to one of the other students and she had told me she had just got back from a meeting with a seller that she met on Kijiji. It was a private, a private seller and the deal wasn't working out, but I was intrigued. And so I decided, well, if she's doing this, I'm going to try to do it too. I'm going to look online. So I looked online, looked on Kijiji and I looked on Craigslist. There it was. It was a house for sale in Toronto. They're asking a million bucks and it happened to be like 10 blocks away from my house. So I messaged the guy and it was an older landlord trying to get out of the real estate game. And he emailed back saying, yeah, it's move-in ready. He doesn't need any renovations. And I'm asking a million bucks. I said, okay, well, I'll go check it out anyway. Even if it's move-in ready, I'll go check this out and yeah, see, yeah. What, see what the project's all about. First of all, it's crazy that you found it on Craigslist. Oh. Who uses Craigslist? Right? I, not me, but <laughs> yeah. it was just, uh, you know, she used Kijiji. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look around other classified yeah. sites. And, and, and there it was. Yeah. So set the appointment. I went to meet him and I walked up to the house and thought to myself, wow, we, we definitely have a different understanding of move-in ready. <laughs> <laughs> this place did not look nice from the outside. And I went inside and it didn't get any better. I looked at it. Okay but he wasn't budging on the price. Mm. So I was there for probably about two hours the first day. It didn't work. I contacted him again like a couple of days later saying, hey, listen, still interested in that property. Maybe we could work something out. He said, well, come meet me at the property. Came to the property, met him again. It was basically the same conversation. I think he was just a lonely dude. And that's okay because we had great talks. He was from France. He immigrated to Canada years and years ago. You know a lot about him. I learned a lot about <laughs> yeah. him. Great guy. And then I left a few days later. I messaged him. I said, listen, like, let's work something out. And he said, just bring me an offer. I did all the paperwork myself. I didn't know what I was doing, kind of. Watched a lot of YouTube videos. Watched a lot of YouTube yeah. videos. Actually, Callum Moore, shout out to him. It was yeah, his yeah, video yeah, that yeah. helped me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was we his gonna... video that helped me figure out how to do the uh, the APS. So I went to the property and I had a, a, an offer that was you know less than the million. I really like to do this deal. You know, if you're willing to work with me, this could help change my life. We talked a little bit more and he's like, okay, I'll give you a chance. And so he signed me the deal. It was a conditional contract based on financing. So I left there and I had this legal contract and I had to come up with 900 grand. So you to... made him an offer for 900,000. Yes. And it was still like a good deal, like below market, but it needed a lot of work. We recognized that it, it needed work. What year was this? This was 2021. What neighborhood? It's in the junction. In the junction. Okay, a million dollars and how many bedroom house? Four bedroom house. I thought nine hundred thousand for a good pl for a place like that. I thought that was a good price. It worked out well, but it was a lot, right? At the time, I, I had never raised any money before from outside sources, and it was on me to try to figure it out. So, spoke with my family. We figured out a way to do some creative financing on some properties. Mm. And then I went to some friends and I said, hey, listen, this is an opportunity here. But actually, before I even got to that, I was in one of my breakout rooms for my real estate group from Trust Your Talent. And I had mentioned I got a property under contract. And this guy was like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. In the junction, like I live near the junction. Mm -hmm. I think it was two days later we met and he agreed to lend me 250000 bucks towards wow. the project a guy from a networking event or from a, like a group a guy from my my group and that that's was huge. when i saw the power of the group because it's a close-knit group of people Dude, that's the full down payment wait a minute but you said you raised money from family and friends too so that means that, did you get financing on it so we bought it all cash wow yeah and that's how much did you raise down payment plus closing carrying costs plus renovation right yeah i think it was 
three. <laughs> Very first deal, one point three million dollar yeah, race yeah, between yeah. between cash tight. and leveraging HELOCs and yeah, and that's and that's the beauty thing. Like the whole network is your net worth. I couldn't have done it without all these people. It was pretty wild because I had never done it before. Met some contractors, got some quotes. I ended up going with uh, a, a TV show. It was supposed to be on a TV show that. It didn't seem to pan out or hasn't panned out to this point. We did seven months from close to close and we it was a profitable deal. And in the process, I decided that uh, I would leave my, my day job and just jump into this full time. What were you doing at the time for your day job? Travel sales. Mm -hmm. So again, during the pandemic, not a lot was going on. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, restrictions. It was high ticket <laughs> yeah. sales and selling travel to people when flights were not allowed to leave airports was... Uh, challenging yeah to say uh, the least to say the yeah. least to say the least so that deal kind of uh, was was the real real launch pad when i realized okay i can do this you got to work with people you can raise money you got to make the right connections go with through the steps of renovating it's not hgtv you have to fight off the challenges you have to be ready for things to go wrong and that's really when you learn stuff right yeah. you learn stuff when things don't go to plan. So you had never raised capital before? No. Have no. you ever flipped a property before? I had not. You hadn't flipped a property, you hadn't raised capital before, and you were able to raise $1.3 million and you flipped a property. How much money did you make profits off of that? I feel like this is an, inter an interrogation. Uh, yeah, no, because I want to know. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell <laughs> me. <laughs> Law and order. Yeah, we, we made over hundred grand on the, on the flip. It was very successful. And I've heard people that say, if you break even on your first flip, it was a good flip. So we were lucky or fortunate or took the right steps, however you want to define it, to come out on top and be successful. For anybody who's working in a full-time job and for them to be thinking about $1.3 million, they need to raise that money, they need to find something to lock that in, and they're not even sure whether or not the real estate is going to take off. Like, What makes you dive into real estate full-time at that moment? It wasn't all right away, right? It was steps. So the first thing that got me thinking that it wasn't a lot of money, well, first of all, it is a lot of money and it was a lot of money, but it was looking at deals and my mentor had said to me, if the deal is good, the money will follow. And so I knew that no matter how much it cost, if, the, if there was money to be made, I could get investors. Because that, that money that was profit was after paying everyone back. One of the friends that lent money, they wouldn't accept a traditional interest payment. And so after the project was done, we actually decided to go to Mexico. So we took everyone to Mexico as a part of our celebration for the flip, I that friend. The yeah, flip going yeah, to plan, yeah. right? We, yeah, so, yeah, we should do that. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that was a pretty good thing. But in terms of getting started, I was looking at different properties that were a lot less money because they were less risky. And my mentor said to me, I think you just need to get out of your own way. You've run the numbers, you see they work, you have your contingencies, all the costs are in play, go for it. The reason why you started doing the real estate investing was start looking into flipping a property is because you were having a bit of trouble with your full time because of the pandemic. Is that why? Or is there different things that made you uh, go into that direction? Through the pandemic, I realized how little control we actually have in our nine to five jobs sometimes where things can happen like a pandemic and you lose control. And that doesn't just stop with a pandemic. It also is with economic downturns. If all of a sudden a company decides that they can't hold you anymore, you see people losing their jobs because of that reason. So I needed to kind of get power for me to do what I needed to do in my life so that nothing else could control that. Part of that too, I'll be transparent. I've, I've had some mental health issues and during the pandemic, it got pretty bad. And I knew that I couldn't control anything that was going on with my life at that time because you're kind of locked down, you're locked to a job and you, you're limited on what you can actually do in that job because of the, you know, the factors at play with the pandemic. And so I knew there had to be something else. I had to take a different step somewhere to change the trajectory of my life. And I saw people doing that through real estate, a lot of uh, pundits online promoting real estate as a vehicle to wealth and to a better life. Grant Cardone's one of them. He had a tough life when he was younger and really got on to do unreal things through his coaching and real estate and everything he does. So he was inspirational for that. But it was out of, almost out of necessity that I needed to take this step because it felt to me it was going to be more risky just to stay doing what I was doing versus take a leap and risk for something. And you risk 1.3 mil. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. It sounds crazy th- about it now. Think about it now, especially in this market when we look at flips. Before we actually got in the interview, Andrew and I were talking a lot about like the sports aspect because you know Andrew's very much into sports, and I think and I find it's interesting because a lot of people who are into sports seem to have almost about them a competitive and also a winning mentality and i still see some of that competitiveness and some of that mentality in you right now so i think we should talk a little bit about that how does a uh, hockey relate to real estate i can do it too, yeah, if you want. i know i know <laughs> in reality the perspective of people who are into sports they talk sports yeah they're talking sports and i think a lot of it has to do with the strategies and like the way the mentality the mentality, mentality. It, it's it. all about mindset. That's all it is. I posted something on Instagram today, and it was to do with that exact thing. It was Derek Jeter at some conference talking about how if you do 30% and you fail 70% of the time Let's in baseball, you you go in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> Failing 70% of the time, he says, the only other profession you can do that is a weatherman. <laughs> yeah. But it just goes to show you, right? Like in business and real estate, you, you have to fail. Yeah, And recently I've done that and it sucks, but it also feels great because you learn and it makes you stronger and you win more. And so that's definitely something with real estate. If you sit around doing nothing, you're not going to score a goal. Yeah. But if you take some shots, you're going to miss. You might get hurt. You might break your stick. Yeah. But eventually, if you do it consistently... You, you know, you'll win. Yeah, yeah. Do you get that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Is that it? Yes, that's it. The only one I really watch a little bit more that I agree with in terms of like applying to my own mentality is uh, is is, any, is martial arts, mm. any kind of fighting. So I'm really into that. I know Ping, Ping's thing is basketball. But what's yours? Hockey, I guess? It'd be hockey. I like the baseball analogy with the percentages because you have to fail. But I think any sport, just that commitment, that grind, you know, the training you do is the same as getting educated and doing your research and looking at listings and running numbers, pro formas and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all that preparation. Then when it comes to the game to make an offer or to execute on a deal, you're ready. Yeah, you've yeah, done yeah. all that work previously. What is the thing that the nerds play, like imaginary hockey or whatever? Uh, fantasy, fantasy football. Fantasy, the nerds, yeah. I mean. I'm, <laughs> nerds. You know, yeah. I'm about to lose my fantasy football week yeah. tonight. Oh, but hey, that's, you know. You know what? Actually, I always <laughs> wondered, I was talking about this with one of my friends, but what sport do you think or is most relatable to like business or real estate or is it just equal across the board, you think? Any sports, man, because you're not working for 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 the money, right? You're like, well, in a way, yes, but like all the preparation that you put to work, like you're not going to say, hey, because I practice like two hours, so I need to get paid right now, right? It's just a different mindset. It's a business mindset where you just try to prepare as much as possible. You're only getting a short period of time to be on the platform to really perform, right? But like the, it's all the prepar- preparation and the mindset behind it. If we do specific sports, I would probably campaign for football, yeah, like American football yeah. being the biggest one. And the reason being is that in business, we all know we need different departments, different people doing different things that sometimes don't interact at all. Yeah. But right? you have accounting over here, you have operations over here. They don't really need to talk all the time, maybe sometimes. Mm-hmm. And with football, if you look at an offense running a play, you have the quarterback, he's going to do his thing, he's going to find his receivers. You have linemen that are the guys that just in, in the trenches that hit every, every play. Yeah. They have nothing to do with the quarterback actually throwing the ball. All they need to do is prevent the guys in front of them from reaching the quarterback. And then the receivers, they're over here running around doing what they need to do so the linemen have nothing to do with the receivers. So in short, you have all these moving parts and you need everyone to do their job and do their job well. You know, if one of the systems fails, it's going to affect everything. You need to have that coach to crew everybody together and to make sure that the elder players are coachable, right? To yeah. just do what, they, what they're told to do and, and what they're trained to do and, and trust the system, trust the coach that uh, this is the direction that we're going to win. Bill Belichick, legendary coach, arguably the best of all time for the Patriots. He had that moniker a few years ago, and their whole slogan for the year was do your job. Do your job. Do your job. You show up, you do your job, you take care of business the way you need to take care of business. Business, there you go. I didn't a even mean to. Business takes care of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you do your job, the team will succeed because everyone just takes care of what they need to do and yeah. the job gets done and you get yeah. your wins you get your money you get paid yeah. the, the cliche That's things sure. work i mean the your teamwork makes the dream work <clears throat> yeah right? yeah and again it's true yeah the one and we talked about the other day at, at an event it was your network is your net worth yeah I, I couldn't handle hearing that so much all the time until I, I did a deal where it was literally no money of my own mm. and it was other people other partners that i met through networking yeah and they paid for the deal. Like, well, that literally was part of my net worth because my net worth was because of the network. You roll your eyes sometimes until you certainly get to 
take advantage of that opportunity and yeah and create something beautiful yeah that's yeah. because people say it almost to the point of a cliche and then it's only the people like yourself who are actually applying it that really kind of get it because yeah it, sometimes it just gets over said overdone right speaking of which is there anything that you feel maybe in terms of like sports etiquette sports mindset or you know you, you mentioned that you do also some fan fantasy games right is there any way you feel that you're taking directly things that you apply to that or things that come from there into your real estate endeavors i think discipline would be one of them i mean when i'm when i'm sitting on my couch sunday morning and i'm planning my fantasy lineup for my football day it takes discipline you can't look at all the hype you can't look at who you think or who your favorite player is to put in the lineup you have to look at the numbers you have to look at the opponents and see what is realistic to expect from your fantasy players that day and i've never used that analogy before <laughs> but since but since you brought up the fantasy thing that is where that is where that intersects there with the discipline looking at the numbers don't get emotional about the players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stick to the facts. If you just replace all the <laughs> fantasy football with like stock, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be good, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Freaking advice. I, I won't tell you my fantasy football record this year because it's uh, not the best. But my real estate game's on point. Yeah, that, that's working out <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, but yeah. The, the the fantasy is hey, taking a hit. Have you guys seen that movie Moneyball? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I feel like sometimes it's like that, right? Because even when people are talking about, you know, actually we're talking to somebody who's all about money, the uh, the numbers don't lie, the numbers don't lie, right? And they they play a big role in it. You have to balance it out with a degree of perspective, reality, intuition, but you can't ignore the numbers, right? And that's why sometimes when people will talk about like, um, you know, would you invest in Sudbury? Would you invest in somewhere else? And people say, why would you go there? Why would you go there? It's mm -hmm. just like, bro. Don't feel so emotional about it. Just look at what's going on in the spreadsheets and tell me if this makes sense to you. Take everything else that you know about the place out of the equation. But, you know, maybe not all of it. Like if somebody told me the same thing, I'm just like, oh, yeah, these numbers are great. Where is that? Detroit. Um, I might think about it a little bit, right? Maybe. And again, it's all about the numbers. It's about the goals, too. Detroit has great cash flow because of the purchase price of properties. Yeah. But long term, who knows? It's not necessarily in an upward trajectory of population growth. But in terms of looking at numbers, when I was looking for a market to kind of dive deeper into, I looked at the map of Canada. I looked at all the, the bigger cities yeah. and tried to figure out, okay, where in Canada do the numbers work the best? Without having been to many of these places on paper, what did the numbers say? Mm -hmm. And New Brunswick came out on top as the best, you know, best numbers wise. Cash flow numbers wise. Cash flow. And then I also like to look at what is the long term growth? So, a place like Moncton, New Brunswick, where yeah. a lot of immigration is flooding into, they're putting a lot of money in there. They're building a lot. It's the hub of the Maritimes. Yeah, because isn't it, and sorry to interrupt, but isn't it also that the Canadian immigration tries to incentivize people to go there, right? That's right. I mean, sometimes I don't know what the government is doing behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. sometimes they don't even want to answer questions about why they're doing stuff, but not to get into that. But there is a focus to send immigration to those cities like Moncton, yeah. even though right now their vacancy is at about 0%. They just need more population to go go to the East Coast. I, I remember they were giving out tons of incentive to like PEI for immigrants to go to PEI, and that's why I ended up being there for two years. You were, were in PEI? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I was there for two years. Be I've never been. Yeah, no, no, no. It was a, it was honestly a great How's the real estate there? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know, actually. I don't know. But, but I remember a lot of people who landed there, they, they wanted to eventually go to like uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, right? Just because there's a little bit more infrastructure. So I think what you're doing is, is, is great. Like you see that there's a population growing over there. There's a lot of like uh, city development over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you essentially just like find a good spot. And also landlord tenant board over there is a lot more friendly to the, yeah, to the tenant, okay. uh, sorry, to the landlord. I'd like to see it's more fair, you know, like friendly, fair. It's more fair because- I like the words. <laughs> we, have, yeah. we have to pay mortgages as investors. <laughs> and in order to do that, we need our customers, our tenants to pay the rents. Yeah. And in Ontario, we've seen it time and time again where it just, there's an imbalance and it doesn't seem fair. I read an article today where this guy, landlord, he lost his house through a, a separation with his partner, which sucks, but he had a rental property and this rental property people had not been paying his tenants there. So he was down, I think it was $31,000 and he was living in his car. Yeah. And that wouldn't happen in a place like New Brunswick because in New Brunswick, you have a rentalsman there. They kind of I don't know, take care of business, if you will, but not against tenants or anything like that. It's just to keep things fair. You have to pay your rent, just like we have to pay for anything we want 
as a customer, we can't just go and take it. We definitely are living in a society where people kind of take uh, take something that is good. Like tenant rights are good. Mm-hmm. Tenant rights, uh, they need they need Absolutely. protection because there's a lot of like I hear about it all the time. Uh, tenants will tenants from through like my uh, TikTok uh, channel. They will message and say that you know I this is what's happening. And you hear so many stories of tenants being taken advantage of. So yeah. I understand why it's there. Some people will take these facilities that are there to to help people and abuse them. Yeah, right. That's that's and what that's happens. why the fact that we have this notion of a professional tenant and all these other mm-hmm. things is it's ridiculous that it's even a concept. You shouldn't be able to abuse things to this extent. And that's the thing. Like there are bad actors anywhere whatever you do like there's bad tenants out there yeah. there's bad landlords out there yeah we we know that and we don't want to paint everyone with the same brush so when yeah. we can at least have a system in place like the landlord tenant board but maybe something that's a little more balanced a little more fair it's better for everyone Andrew, how, walk us through how you decide on new brunswick and how did you put the infrastructure over there because again a lot of people who are thinking about investing remotely not even like out of province, out of city. The fear of not being able to keep things under control is going to be super high. And now you're talking about a place that you can't even drive there. How do you manage all of that? How do you build your power team over there? I think the best mentality that I can share is uh, it came from a mentor of mine. And they said, okay, when you go to a property and you walk through it, you have your realtor there, right? They found the listing and they open the door or whatever. And they're telling you about what they know about the property. And you're with them in your listing. And then you have a contractor go with you and you're walking through with a contractor and they're pointing out things that they need to fix or they think should be fixed. And then there's a property manager that will either be there with you or they'll go through after telling you what you need to know or what you need to update in order to get a top market rent. The mentor said to me, if you have all these people going in there who are professionals who do those specific tasks for a living, what makes you think you're so special? that you can find something else in there that they don't already know and can't point out. And so in summary, it's having that power team and whether it's here and you're with them walking through places or if it's out of town, you have them in place and you trust them. So getting over that fear, well, it took some time, but I went out to the market, toured around the market. I met a bunch of different people Realtors, property managers, even mortgage brokers that can help facilitate some so of the deals. you did go over. To, I did. I okay. did. Did you attend a networking event there or something? At the time, there were no networking events going on. It's not like in the GTA where it's almost like every week you can find something. Well, how'd you find them? Okay. Some through referrals for friends of mine, colleagues that already have businesses set up in Moncton. Mm-hmm. Also through Facebook, you can ask well for recommendations from Facebook groups. Also, I noticed when I was browsing listings, something on Realtor you'd see some, uh, some realtor names keep popping up on listings. So, you know, multi-units, I kept seeing certain names. So I pursued those people. Like, okay, well, if obviously, if they're the power players in the multi-unit space, then I should be speaking with them. Yeah. And they can help lead me in the right directions. That way, too, they have trust behind them. If they're doing so much business, they probably know what they're doing. Now, we trust but verify. We can't just go off based on, okay, yeah, their name is everywhere, so they must be good. We have to go there or at least get on the phone. <clears throat> I have people who hadn't gone to their market at all. They bought properties for two years, built up incredible portfolios out of province and only saw their properties after acquiring, I'd say north of 10, a year later to go see them. Mm-hmm. So they'd never seen them in person before. But that's because they put that infrastructure in place through a power team, through networking, through phone calls. Obviously, video calls are great too because you can see each other. FaceTiming at properties for walkthroughs, that's a tool we can use as well. (laughs) I know, it's an amazing thing. We use it for all the stupid things, but not for the great things, right? Yeah. (laughs) Actually, I said to my wife the other day, I was on my phone and I I signed a contract and I I think I sent an email or whatever, things that we do every day on phones. I'm like, wow, it is pretty wild how I was going to open my computer to do this and I just did it from my smartphone. Yeah. It, I didn't need to whole set up a work day and fire it up and get a you, coffee and start typing. It was like... You could have been sitting on the throne doing that. I might have been. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you gone through a process where you, you met someone, you, get, uh, you have the power team to actually work on something and then you realize that, okay, it's not a good fit, so you have to replace it with some other members? That does happen. You usually know pretty early, in my experience, where you're talking to someone, you're setting things up. And I think the biggest misconception about a power team is what you just said is that when I was starting, I thought I had to have a team, almost like I had to have like a sports team and sign everybody to a long-term contract so that we could move forward together over a you know five-year period of acquiring properties. But what I did learn early on is that not every person you put into place is going to fit in. And not every person is going to want to listen to what you have to say based on what you've learned. 
I believe in a lot of education for real estate. That's how I've built kind of my my foundation of knowledge. Sometimes I'm speaking to these professionals and they don't quite understand what I'm saying. They don't understand the strategies that I have in place that I know are possible because other real estate investors have done it beforehand. So sometimes those ideas clash. Something like a lease option. Some realtors or more so mortgage brokers don't want to touch lease options. They think they're a scam and whatever. Meanwhile, they're just another tool to help people get into home ownership. And it happens to be a great tool for real estate investors to to make money, but also find people homes that couldn't otherwise get into homes. So if you have someone like a mortgage broker who doesn't see eye to eye with that and they're a part of your power team, you kind of have to move on from them. You know, it's it's not always a great situation. Well, I had this one instance where a realtor found out I was talking to another realtor in the same market. I was up front from the beginning saying like, listen, I'm an investor. I need to have a lot of lines in the water. If you bring me the deal, I'm not going to sign it with anyone else. Like I will, I will be working with you on that deal, but I can't sign an exclusivity contract with you because that hurts my business. I did say, if you want to sign an exclusive exclusivity agreement with me and we only work with each other, that's fine. But obviously as a realtor, they don't want to do that. They can't limit their clients to me and I can't limit my opportunities to what only they bring me. That's such a good way to put it. I too. know. Yeah. Yeah. I like if you that. want me to be your, like, uh, if you, if you want me to only use your service, then you got to bring the same thing to me, right? Like you should only be working with me, not yeah. any other buyers. That's a good thing for, I think, a lot of realtors to hear because uh, a lot of, a lot of, they teach realtors to get that exclusivity contract signed. The principles behind it make sense. But the thing is that we live in a world today where you want to sign with people who can demonstrate talent. And that's why we even taught a lot of realtors and don't, don't bother with the exclusivity contract. Have them commit to you with work based on merit. Me, the person that they're just like, I have to work with this person. Yeah. Not I not I have to work with this person because I'm locked in. Yeah. Right. I have to because this guy's gonna make me win. That that's not a good situation where you're only working with someone because you have to. I think it's good for a lot of end users, like a lot of residential buyers who are looking for their first home, second home, or whatever, something like that, where yeah, you don't really want them talking to a whole bunch of different people. But ultimately, as investors, we're just looking for opportunities. Yep. We're not going to step on anyone else's toes, or at least I'm not going to. And I know you guys wouldn't because this is a people business. We want to treat our people well, whoever we're working with. Small community. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're not going to go any behind anyone's backs. If you send me a deal, well, I'm going to work with you on that deal. But you need to send it to me. You need to do that work too. I'm not just going to start feeding you listings that I've found so that you can write offers. It needs to be a two-way street or or a multiple-way street so that we're all diversifying our deal flow. I like the way even you're you're talking about it because it, on the um, back to the portion about how sports mentality really brings it in. Like I think one of the things they identify in sports is that your teammates are not always going to be your friends and your mm. friends don't always make the best teammates, right? Because I think a lot of people will will want to work with their realtor that's a friend of theirs and they will go into a foreign market that their friend has absolutely no experience in. Yeah. And if their friend knew any better and wasn't greedy about the money, they would advise them you should find somebody local over there because they'll probably be able to get you a better deal, have more infrastructure, and will definitely just generally know more than what I would know, right? Mm -hmm. Know more about the market. That's why even here in Hamilton, we see a lot of uh, realtors are coming in from Toronto because they work with their Toronto clients or their friends, but they don't know what they're doing. They will overbid. They will not have the correct infrastructure. They will not know how to recognize problems over the mm -hmm. profits when it comes to this market, right? So people do need to build teams where you operate and it's not about friendship. A hundred percent. And especially in a city like Hamilton where a street during the day could look perfectly fine. And then when the the lights go out, so to yeah. speak, it changes a little bit. So a realtor or a lot. from or, or a lot. <laughs> yeah. So a, a realtor from Toronto who has maybe never been to that neighborhood during the evening and they've only been during the day, that's not something they're going to set their client up very well for if all of a sudden they close on a property and they start seeing business going on in the evening time that they would rather not be around as a homeowner. So having that local expert and that local pro is awesome. As much as like I love supporting my friends' businesses. Mm -hmm. I've done it before, I will continue to do it. But there is a point where you need to make sure that they have to be a professional and an absolute expert in that space because this is our livelihood. This is putting food on our table as professionals. If this is a beer league hockey team where we just want to go out, have fun, have some drinks, get some exercise, have a sweat, then yeah, it doesn't matter who's playing what position, how good they are. It doesn't really matter because none of us are going to the NHL, but this is our NHL. This is our professional league of real estate that we play in. 
So we need to work with other professionals in order to win. By the way, let's talk about your power team in uh, New Brunswick. Like, who do you have on the team right now? Specific names? No, no, no. Okay, the roles. <laughs> roles. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of yeah, professional. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so in terms of power team members in out of province, right now we do have uh, several realtors that we're working with that are sending us different deals, helping us with comparables, whether they're off market deals or on market. And again, we're working with them, having an open dialogue. And they understand that we're working with different people to try to increase our deal flow. So realtors is one. Property management is huge. There is a long-term traditional residential property manager that we have there for multi-units. There's also a short-term rental specialist as well as a property manager. They do short-term and they do mid-term as well. So those are two property managers we have in place there. There's also contractors. So there's a couple different contractors. Mm -hmm. And you need to diversify that space because on this recent acquisition, we had one that was all ready to go. They had some personal things come up and they weren't able to execute and go forward with the job. Luckily, through connections of our property manager, we were able to find another contractor. So those are some of them there. Insurance. Insurance is one too. We have a local insurance company that helps us, a broker, helps us get insurance packages. So they're local as well. They know the markets. They know where to avoid. In fact, I had no idea before I started doing research and I went to the market and talked more about it. But there's even certain parts of the parts of the province that they like to stay away from, yeah. or at least premiums are a lot higher in certain <clears throat> areas because of a history of fraud. And so, I want to actually use this as an opportunity to bring up that very good point because a lot of people kind of say, "Okay, I'm going to find the property and I'm going to find somebody who's going to do the insurance because, like, you know, whatever I can find it." But people don't realize how significant insurance can mm -hmm. be, and it's good idea to talk to somebody even in conjunction while well, when you're finding properties mm -hmm. because they will be able to tell you that yeah, certain areas are a little more difficult to insure. As long as they're experienced, they'll know this. And this should tell you a little something about where you're buying. Further to that, we talked about the sports before and how there's similarities and you have to fail or in order, like you have to take your shots. Sometimes you're going to fail. Sometimes you're going to win. I did have a situation where la earlier this year, I acquired a property. I assumed there was a certain insurance cost based on some of the other properties I've been looking at. Little did I know that because it was a one kilometer further, from the fire station than the previous property I looked at, it was a drastic difference in the insurance cost. Oh, this is for the country property. This is, yeah, yeah. it's for a rural property. So that's, you know, I learned that the hard way, mm -hmm. but now I know part of that due diligence is getting that specific quote for that specific property. Yeah. Even if it's in the same neighborhood and the same, well, similar property, you can't just assume anything. You need to get those quotes. And that's why you work with an insurance broker that can help you with protecting yourself. Yeah, those are little nuances that like, how do you know? And unless they, somebody might say it at a seminar, but you might not catch it, mm -hmm. right? It might not stick with you until you really learn it the yeah, hard way, right? Yeah. Do you have a home inspector on your team? We do. We, we've used one. Well, actually we've used two, but there's one that is a go-to. So yes, definitely a home inspector is part of the, is part of the team because when we get a property under contract, part of the due diligence, obviously we want to get that home inspection. We have more abilities in this market now because we're coming down a little bit. We have a little more flexibility as buyers, whereas before there was a lot of those no condition offers going in over the past couple of years. The frenzy. Yeah, the frenzy, mm -hmm. the craziness. So now we can actually be uh, way more responsible. I don't want to see just responsible, way more responsible by having those checks and balances in place. Home inspector, also the appraiser, local appraiser. Um, that, that helps too. And you, you need it as a part of the power team because yeah. when you're going to, buy something for a large amount of money, let's make sure it's worth what you're paying for. Yeah, I was going to say, because uh, if you have a realtor who's going to obviously try to like make the deal or make the transaction happen, and then you have a property manager who also wants to close on this one so they, have, they can expand their business a little bit, and also the contractor, it sounds like everybody's trying to push forward. So it is really important to also have that home inspector to be like, to be the def defensive player who says, <laughs> oh, whoa, 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 that looks messed up. No kidding. When they start yeah. bringing you things like, oh, yeah, that GFCI outlet needs to go in that part of the kitchen. It's like, okay, okay. Yeah, it does. We'll get that done. No problem. But bring me a real issue. You know, like they want to point out everything, which is actually really good. Because mm -hmm. if you have a stickling home inspector, they can point out everything possibly wrong with the property. And then you can look at it, read it through with the contractor as a part of the power team and really make your decisions. What do we need to do? How much is each thing going to cost that we're actually going to do? And what is a home inspector looking at and over compensating on 
and just kind of making a mountain out of a molehill. I want to throw in two things here, actually. And one of them was something I heard from another client of ours where he bought a property in Edmonton. And uh, he found out after he did, he has a power team too. And he found out that he bought a property that ended up being totally infested with bed bugs. Mm. And I swear you not, he says he spent close to 100K trying to get rid of them. Oh, it's on the apartment building, right? Yeah, it was apartment building. Yeah. It was apartment building. But anyway, so he was talking about how he did everything right by the book and he thought he was good. And I'm just like, what would you have done differently? And he says, I would have had somebody go through with a dog. I'm mm. like, that's an interesting. So you can add a dog to your power team or something like that. Or, or at least to your uh, claws. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or something. But I'm just like, why? What would that have done? He's like, they have specially trained dogs that can sniff these things out. And he says, if I knew that, I would have at least, uh, I would I would do that as part of an inspection for a larger building. And I'm like, that's wow. very interesting. He says, if I would have done that before, I would. Anyway, it's just interesting mm. how people learn these little nuanced things by having certain experiences in different places, right? And uh, that's just like one little thing here. Yeah, I, I find that it's a little difficult to actually implement that from the very beginning. <laughs> You need to like go through some some no. sort of challenge before you feel like okay that's needed. Yeah, well, yeah, to think that that's needed, right? But I mean, uh, if you think about it, when you're buying, let's say, an 18 unit apartment building, I mean, it's a relatively minor expense to hire a pest control company that has that, that has that service. That's Apparently, true. he says that over there you could hire that through a pest control company. Oh wow! And I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, nuances of the market. Like I think a good local realtor should have been able to say that. Well, maybe not should have, but might have had the insights, right? That's teetering a gray area, but it's just an interesting story. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, if the building didn't have bed bugs prior, does that constitute a clause? He never in saw the, it, right? Like he didn't in the know. contract. How would you know it has bed bugs? Because the sellers might not be totally upfront about that, right? Of course, and buyer of beware, course. right? Buyer do due diligence. But that would lead me to another thing because one of the th one of the questions I had as you were talking about building out your power team, a lot of the ones where we're talking about mortgage broker insurance, a lot of these things have done remotely, realtor even. You can look at reviews, references, and all that. Um, one of the things that I see a lot of people doing with power teams that they're building, a lot of it they find hinges on the contractors. And one of the things that people will do sometimes is they'll hire two contractors at the same time or three if they're doing multi-unit properties mm. and get, they get them to start working at the same time. And whoever performs best, they will give the rest of the contract to that person. But then it sometimes causes animosity between the two contractors. Have you ever done something like that? And if so, what's your experience? I haven't. I, I don't know if I agree with that mentality of to try to pit each other against one another and see who's the best it's yeah. like going into a uh, a ring and okay the last man standing is the winner yeah i don't know if i agree with that i think we should do our due diligence based on references get quotes get thorough understandings of scopes yeah and hire one contractor at a time because many of these contractors have multiple teams that they can come in and they can do multiple units mm -hmm. i think it's different if the contractor can't handle the volume that you need for a certain project. So if you have an eight unit building and they say, well, I can only renovate four, there are eight vacant units and you need to get them up and running right away. Yeah. I think you're well within your right to hire somebody else for the other four. Yeah. And maybe based on that, the continued relationship can be one or another, but doing scale, you need several contacts anyway. Yeah. When you're doing scale, like that's the thing, we find ourselves in a bit of a fortunate position where if we have a contractor that we're trying out and they're not performing, we chances are we have another contractor somewhere else that is performing that can pick up the slack. But if you're just doing one unit or one property mm -hmm. and you have one contractor doing the whole thing and they start to slow down or they grind you to a halt, you need to be able to pick up the slack quickly. So that's why I think a lot of people do it. But yes, I think in an ideal situation, you don't have to do something like that because you can effectively, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth. I understand that. I think uh, my core management in the very beginning, because you don't know each other, I think that's needed. And, and we should all be upfront with our power team. But the moment that your contractor has demonstrated the ability to actually handle the job within the timeline, give them all the trust, right? Yeah. right? Uh, make it easy. Uh, for them to work and then uh, make ourselves to be to be a better client to them so that later on if there's any problem we're going to be prioritized absolutely and i also look at how i would want to be treated too i don't want someone watching over my shoulder all the time and almost using leverage that if i make one little mistake and i'm not as good as the other person well then i'm fired and i'm never getting work again that wouldn't make me feel good i wouldn't be empowered to continue doing a good job mm -hmm. so i think it's part of treating people re with respect giving everyone their fair chances and yeah, I just didn't like the idea of yeah. pitting someone against each other with the yeah. last man yeah. standing. Trust mentality. a talent. Or way, trust your talent. You know what, Andrew, you got such a great way of actually like using the right words to properly describe things. You use like fairness, empowerment. You said <laughs> a lot of good things here that were just more correct. And it's, it's more looking at things in the positive rather than looking at the negative. You know, people have a way of looking at things, uh, taking things as a cynic mm. versus taking things as uh, somebody who is optimistic, right? 
And if you're cynical in your perspective of, like, oh, I need to be, I need to protect myself. What happens if this person fails? It's almost like you're setting yourself up for failure. Right. Right. And whereas if you, if you approach someone, you say, I'm not hiring anyone else. I'm trusting in you. That is in a way empowering somebody. Mm -hmm. And somebody might resonate with that and take it to heart and perform better for you because they know you're trusting in them. Yeah. And you might get burnt. Right? Like yeah. as, as positive, <laughs> let's be real. As let's be positive real. <laughs> as I want to be, like not everything is is sunshine and rainbows and lollipops and everything. Like the yeah. things are going to go wrong. <laughs> but I think if you have that positive mentality, you're already kind of ahead of the curb, right? Like you you set yourself up for success versus failure. Yeah. I I haven't always been like that, and I'm not always like that on a consistent basis. But I do recognize the power it has. Yeah. If we treat things in a positive manner, expect the best from people, don't be too cynical in advance. Let other people give us a reason to be cynical if they cross us. Yeah. But but until then, you know, we trust <laughs> yeah. them. We trust them, and we hope they come through. Yeah, no, for sure. Here's the thing though, you that we do get to respond to the situation. We get we get to control our own emotion. We can, sometimes we may not be able to control the situation. Right? But being able to stay positive positive and know that we get to control our emotion and how we're going to handle that specific situation is actually super powerful. A lot of people when they're a little negative, they tend to just focus on oh, why that happened to me. That takes up all the mental energy. And to the point where they are unable to actually solve that problem. You know, recently I've realized that I actually like taking accountability. Back in the day when I was younger, I didn't ever want anything to be my fault. But talk about empowerment. I actually empower myself now where if something goes wrong and I look at it and really it wasn't my fault, I still somehow find a way to be like, you know what? If I had just done this or this differently, I wouldn't be in this situation. So I only have to look in the mirror and say, Andrew, you made a mistake there. Fix it for next time. And, that, and honestly, that's okay. Like, as long as we're taking away something we can fix, I think it's a positive thing, even if it is a mistake. I feel like that is one of the first steps towards growth is being able to be accountable for the, for the circumstances around you. you no, know, I think as one guy, I really subscribe to his notion of responsibility because he, he basically mapped it onto an equation. He says, you are the only variable you have control of. The formula is this, situation multiplied by your response equals result. You have no control of the situation because that's a fixed, that's a fixed aspect. And then you have control over yourself as a variable. And then whatever the result is, 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 has to do with that equation. What do you have control over here? You. So whenever somebody says that something happened, it doesn't matter how distant it is. When you look at how that situation could have been different, you are the only variable you have control over. So you can only look to yourself as to how to resolve it in the future. 100% because you're the CEO. And if, the, if there's a mistake happening in the company and the board of directors, whatever that is, comes to you and mm. they say, uh, well, this didn't go well. You're not going to say, oh, yeah, well, the guy in the department over there made that mistake. Yeah. No, no, no. You hired that manager that hired that person. Ultimately, you're responsible and you can fix it. Yeah. Or hopefully can fix it. We have a guy, uh, Skyler, you met him. He works oh, yeah. with us, right? And sometimes we would talk with the team and say, you know, the, hey, this is going wrong, you know, and we need to address why this is happening. And I didn't think it was his fault necessarily, but he'd be the kind of guy who would say, yeah, you know what? I can take responsibility for that. And we're just like, this wasn't. Yeah, actually you're doing he's like yeah but i could have done x y and z and the thing is that people should think about that from the other perspective like how do you feel when you're trying to address a problem and somebody who you don't think was responsible for it steps up and says i could have done something that is powerful that is meaningful that is a winning mentality that showcases character the fact that you're saying this that means that you have that and you have that kind of a capacity and and yeah skylar and i were talking the other day he's a great guy and we were, we were talking about almost the same thing where you can do as many follow-ups as possible. And sometimes people still don't kind of do what is needed. And with that, you can still take accountability. And as long as you can say, you know what, that's my fault. I'll take accountability for that. You just have to be able to fix it for the next time. You can't just keep saying it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my fault and not do anything to correct it. Because if we make mistakes, the best part about making mistakes is the ability to correct them and to not let them happen again. That's the one thing about accountability is is very important. Don't just brush it off and say, oh yeah, my bad, you got to fix it. By the way, Andrew, do you talk about the mindset with uh, with uh, some of the students that join your program? Yeah, we're, we're big on yeah. mindset. I mean, at Trust Your Talent, the whole premise of it is building that financial literacy foundation. So starting right from your why and then getting into all the real estate strategies and the more complicated things. It's because so cheesy with your wife. I know, <laughs> but you have to do it for the right reason, yeah. right? If you just wake up one day and you say, you know what, I want to be a real estate investor. I'm going to go do a flip or I'm going to birth something or I'm going to go 
just collect a property because there are property collectors out there. You know, they're <laughs> they, different they from investors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in terms of mindset, it always starts with the why and then setting your goals and then getting rid of the limiting beliefs. And it's reading those books. I love the fact that books are out there and we always encourage everyone in our community to continue to read. There's monthly book clubs as well. We all read the same book. Mm -hmm. But even in our spare time, reading these books written by millionaires and billionaires, what a better way to get training from some of the best minds in the world by spending 20 bucks on a book or mm -hmm. nine bucks on Audible or whatever it is. It's definitely cheapest. And you get to dive into the, these minds of these millionaires for four, five, six hours, however long the book takes. But that all helps with mindset. We do really believe in that structured training because if you just jump into a deal, Yes, it's a great way to learn, but sometimes people don't even know why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. They're doing it because they heard real estate's a good investment and they just want to buy some real estate. Well, if you did that in March of this year, thinking that you were going to be a real estate investor and just bought something, you're going to be in trouble right now. It's, it's probably not going that well if you didn't have a plan in place. So yes, we focus on the mindset and then that mindset leads us to implement a strategy. So we go strategy, market, property. You pick the strategy that best fits your goals. And for that strategy, you find a market. And then from the market, you find the property. A lot of people we find when they're kind of getting started and more, more green to the whole thing, they see a property and they say, I like that property. I want to buy that property. Oh yeah. And it's in Hamilton. So I'm going to buy it because I'm close to Hamilton. And in terms of strategy, uh, whatever that house can do, uh, I'll flip it. Yeah. But it's the wrong order. Yeah. Right. We need to go in the right order. So reverse engineer with, it. Absolutely. Yeah. But start with your mindset. That's with your why. That's with setting your goals. Figure out what you want to do. What are you going to be your strategies? Where are you going to invest? What are the properties they're going to do? It's in that order. It's just you have to go systemized with that. And that's how we help everyone in our community to start from zero to hero. But we also have Cool. I know. Okay. Zero to hero. I know. I know. That was that was bad. But, that was but, but truly, it was at the right moment. <laughs> the, the, what we do is, is we try to get uh, people to financial independence, one student at a time, and that's it. And that's the formula for it. But it takes commitment, and you have to get involved. You have to make sure you dive right into it. And any anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. And people don't always agree with that. But that's part of our mindset thing too. Is yeah. that yes, you can invest in real estate. You don't have any money. You can invest in real estate because you have to make the contacts, you have to learn the basics, and you will be successful. Stick with Money's it. Money's not the only commodity. It's yeah. 100%. By not. the way, Andrew, did you feel like it's harder to train people the technical stuff, which is like deal funding, deal flow, right? All the way to like analyzing deals and financing and uh, up until like closing the property and execution. Is that more difficult to teach people or the mindset? Well, we start with the mindset. You need to harbor that mindset in order to even get to the next steps. Yeah. And if you have the right mindset, you'll also know that part of your process needs to be a power team. And once you have that power team in place, they take care of a lot of the technical pieces to it in terms of getting your deal flow. And you have to oversee that and make sure that that machine is working properly. You wouldn't even move forward without recognizing, okay, this, this person's uh, mindset is actually in the right place. It, it's not going in the right order because if okay. you do things out of desperation as well, that's a really good way to fail. You need to do things with confidence. Yeah. I, I was hearing this podcast the other day. I don't remember what it was, but they were saying you were 31% smarter in a positive state of mind. So that also means you're 31% dumber if you're being negative. Dude, right? Everything you're saying is so moving. And it's funny because I listen to these things and it's like, okay, yeah, that's probably true because if you have the right mindset and you're being positive about the future, you can make better decisions. And that's that 31% smarter yeah. to reach your goals. But if you're out of desperation, oh my goodness, I got to make money. How am I going to make money? Okay, real estate. Well, then I'm just going to buy something and get into real estate. You make a bad decision and you do the opposite. Yeah, I got to throw something in here because you're, you're contextualizing a lot of things even for myself because when I reflect upon it and when I was younger and I wanted to get into coaching, one of the things is that when people would talk about mindset, I'm just like, these guys are so fluff. These guys are just talking about such conceptual things. I will never be able to apply any of this. But as I grew and as I hired coaches and as I learned, one of the things I realized is people who talk about mindset 
really were actually more advanced、mm. and they knew what they were talking about. People who teach you how to do technical things, you can learn them anywhere. You can read a manual, yeah, but you、Google. cannot meet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you cannot learn mindset through a manual as well as you can learn it through somebody who can identify your problems and resonate with you. And that's one of the things I consider one of the more advanced things because when people learn it, and and I and I found that there was a limitation in myself. And in the students in general, I wanted to learn how to solve immediate problems, immediate technical things, and I wanted to know how to solve this specific problem. But that's a limitation of the student's mind. When you learn how to solve a problem, you're learning how to do a job. And the thing about it is that the mentality, the mindset aspect of it, of it, that's the driving force at the root that takes you from point A to point Z, not from point A to point B. Because、right. point A to point B is how do I write this contract. Right, but the、yes. point A to point Z is how is is everything else that encompasses it because it's the mindset that drives you. It's your why, right? That, that's what takes you from the through through the journey. Sometimes people only know what they know, right? They don't know what they don't know, right? So、yeah. uh, the fact that you just want to solve a specific problem sometimes it, it takes you away from having that kind of、uh, confidence to to know that you can reach out to other resources to learn other things,、mm -hmm. which will <clears throat> apply to your current situation, right? That's why a lot of students when they were like so. Desperate finding out the answer for one specific thing, it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, slow down. Let's walk through the whole scenario. Let's figure out why you got yourself into that position, and make sure that you actually start building up a bit of confidence that you can handle your emotion and you can handle the situation by your, on your own. Absolutely, and one thing you said there in terms of talking to other people, the one thing about mindset, you can't do it by yourself. You you literally cannot do it by yourself. You can read all the books you want, podcasts, take all the courses you want, paid or free. You're never gonna get there because you need a community around you that understands your goals and understands the mindset you need to get to those goals. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people that don't have the mindset that we do, don't prescribe to the real estate game. They just don't get it. They don't understand why we're even investing in real estate because it's too risky. It's too this. It's too that. It's too expensive or whatever. So you need the right people to surround yourself with. In a community, and that's actually something we have, and we pride ourselves on that community. We had a networking event the other day, and everyone there is talking about all their hopes and dreams and goals and successes and failures. Whereas if you go to, I don't know, a、uh, bar, a bar, <laughs> and, and you start chatting with people at the bar or even friends, traffic, you know? politics, rent sucks,、oh, bosses, yeah, and it's <laughs> also. You know what I noticed too, when we're in those settings. And take it, take an inventory next time. It's constantly complaining. Oh yeah, like, complaining's great. Like oh, traffic. <laughs> oh, the construction. I can't believe they built these bike lanes、yeah. or whatever. Like we all get into this, and it it doesn't do anyone any favors. But、yeah. when you have a community of people that are strategically positive, and are working towards goals, and they're using real estate as that vehicle for investing, wow, we can do big things together. You're not restricted. You're not bound, or you're not being,、uh, you know. Restricted by these problems, the problems、yep. don't define you. The potential、yep. is what defines you. Yep,、right? You're not like, being judged either. Yeah, no one's、exactly. judging you, like because you're working on the same goals. I know. And you know what? Sometimes I joke when we host our networking events. You know, one of the things I say is like when people say, "Oh yeah, why is it that you're doing this? Why are you giving the education?" And we say, "Oh, we we want friends to talk to. You know, we yeah, want we yeah, want people、yeah. who aren't going to tell us with that. You know, yes, you say you can do this. You say this." But can you actually do this? And it's like, well, some things, some of our ambitions, like we talk about things that we're doing that we haven't done yet. We're putting down the foundation blocks. People hide it as in they're just trying to look up your best interest. Like people、mm -hmm. who say, "I'm poking holes in your plan just so that we can like identify the problems," but really they're just using it as an excuse to be negative. There's a million and one reasons why things can't work. You only need one reason why it can and make that happen. Exactly. And I actually love now when people do try to poke holes. Because I'm always up for debate, I'm always up for discussion as long as it's meaningful and, and productive. Yeah. And if you want to come to me and question what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, I'm more than happy to have that conversation because that gives me the ability to explain to you why I'm doing it,、mm -hmm. and maybe I can help you. Because if you're that skeptical and critical, you're not going to believe what I'm saying. Well, then li at least listen to what I have to say. There's a two type of people, right? One one type of people is like they're generally wanting to find out what you're doing and then see if they can have a bit of takeaway. Uh, that they can apply to their life. There's also going to be another type of people who just want to be negative. They actually don't want to see you succeed because the moment that you actually succeed with the things that you say, it makes them feel bad. Yeah, there's productively negative, and then there's people who are just trying to dampen you because effectively, if you succeed, you're a testament to what they could have done and they didn't. You know what? I believe even though there are those two types of people in the world, and there's actually multiple types of people. But if we use those two as an example, I think anyone, even if you come in with the most negative view of any of this stuff, 
you can figure it out. You just have to read the right books, listen to the right things, and understand some of the strategies. If I even think if you're coming in there to be negative and to shut it down, I think that with the right exposure, you can turn that around into believing. And I'm open to talking with anyone who who wants to challenge me or wants to learn how to do it. We can have a conversation. We know what it is too, because (laughs) even like look at politics these days, right? You have usually two sides to a political situation, issue, argument, whatever you want to say. The biggest issue at hand has nothing to do with the actual topics being discussed. It comes down to the communication most of the time. And people are just not willing to listen to each other and have dialogue. People are uh, you know, freezing other people out. They don't want to talk to them if they have a different uh, view on bike lanes, for instance. Meanwhile, if we just shared our experiences, we shared our thoughts, we could actually probably come to an agreement and, and, and understand each other better. Yeah. It's not going to work every time. It's not going to solve the world problems. But with this, at least you can have that dialogue. Sometimes it becomes not always about academic debate. It becomes about talking points. That's the thing. People enter conversations not necessarily with the intent of learning and discussing and sharing. People enter the debate, enter debates and conversations for the point of being heard and mm-hmm. winning a conversation. It really has nothing to do with any of those things. And so people, people converse for the wrong reasons. When it comes to having conversations with people, I've noticed that there has been a lot of challenges when it comes to why people say the things that they wish to say. Like sometimes people will say things are negative and I... And and I analyze this to, are they saying this because they're negative? Are they saying this because they, they, they don't want good for me? Are they mm. saying these things because they are just cynical about life in general? What, what is it? Why is it that some people do these things? And also the way people go about conversing and people lack communication skills. Now, what I mean by that, and I want you to tell me what you think about this. So people sometimes do not distinguish between what they know and what they believe. Mm. And that is something like, honestly, I swear to God, I heard it on TikTok. <laughs> right? Okay, okay. I heard it on TikTok. Social and media I was is just great. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, when people listen to, to, to TikToks and they hear these really motivational stuff, like when there's a will, there's a way and you don't realize how true it is, right? Mm-hmm. Because when there's a will, if I want to invest in real estate, I might not have money, but I have social skills and I can network to get into real estate. So, you know, there's, when there's a will, there is a way. So back to the point about people don't know how to converse. People need to distinguish in order for you and me to have a productive conversation. I need to distinguish between what I know and what I believe. And sometimes we can have light conversations and some things will be fundamental truths and some things will be beliefs. Mm-hmm. And I need to distinguish between the two because when I believe, I'm, start to, I'm starting to guess. When I say uh, you cannot know what you believe, you cannot believe in what you know for sure. And what you know, you cannot believe because that's a contradiction because believing casting a bit of doubt because you don't necessarily 100% know it. And then what people do is they start throwing in things they believe, like when it comes to the market, and then they use those as pillars of fact, Mm. and they're not pillars of fact. And they have to say, this is what I think, or this is what I believe, and I don't know this for sure, but if this, then this. But at least we've then identified that this is a possibility, not a fact. But people speak about beliefs in a sense of fact. And then it becomes difficult to have productive, meaningful conversations that lead to solutions because you've now replaced facts with beliefs. Well, I think this topic is huge right now with media. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because with media, we don't know what truths are anymore because depending on what channel you're watching or what TikTok account, right? Like (laughs) you don't know what is true and what is a belief, but perception is reality. And that's both on Instagram or in the news. So if you're thinking something is a certain way, That is your truth. Yeah. And that is the dangerous game that we are in right now in the world. It really messes with people. So Mm -hmm. when you're having a conversation, most people can't differentiate between the two. Sometimes I don't. I mean, I get passionate about a topic like the Leafs are the best team in the NHL. Facts. Right. (laughs) You know, maybe it's a fact in the regular season sometimes, not in the playoffs. But for people who are not 100% ready to start uh, getting themselves involved in a community, is there any other things that you would recommend doing? Like watching like some videos, podcasts? or Watching some, sports. Some <laughs> Are there anything that you feel like can contribute to their mind shift? You have to dip your toes in somewhere. So I think like a rich dad, poor dad would be the, the first start. Uh, that's a book for, for those of you who don't know. And uh, it's a fantastic book. It really does set the table for a lot of what we're talking about in terms of that greater mindset and why we use real estate as a vehicle. So I would say, number one, read that book. You know, if you're at all interested, give, give it a read. I have people tell me like, oh, what well, I don't like to read. Well, you know what? There's an audio book. I'm sure there is of that. Uh, I haven't listened to it, but I've read that actual yeah. book. So you can listen to the audio book. 
if you're at all interested in this stuff, that's a great starting point. You know, there's a lot of YouTube resources as well, Property Hustlers YouTube channel. There's free information on there. But another step would probably be going to a networking event. Like there's a lot of them out there. Some are free, some are paid. They're all great because you're going to meet someone. If you meet one person at a networking event, it's worth it. Yeah. You get to build that contact. Have more conversations too. And that might be the most powerful thing. Get in a room or get online in a virtual room where there's other people who have done it or are who, who are doing it and that you can feed off of the energy from. And that way you can kind of move forward. And it's not for everyone. And that's the thing. Not everyone should do this. Not everyone should invest in real estate because not everyone can handle the ebbs and flows on the roller coaster that it is because it is a roller coaster, just like any entrepreneur in any business. But you have to start somewhere or if you're even remotely thinking about it, try one of those resources or you know what? You can find me on Instagram. I'll talk to you. We'll have a chat. We can go through it. Any doubts or anything like that, I'm always happy to, to do that. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. But if you're willing to commit, anyone can do it. Yeah. So how do people find you? I'm on Instagram. Uh, just search my name, Andrew Cowie. I'll, I'll pop up there. And um, yeah, I, I love to connect with people, whether you want to rip real estate apart and tell me how doom and gloom it is right now with the interest rates and the market and dropping prices. No problem. We can talk about that. Or we can talk about the future and how great it's going to be because real estate goes up and down all the way up and we're in it for the long term and we're going to be successful and it's more fun doing it together. Uh, one thing I will say is that building out wealth and this journey towards uh, financial freedom is, is great. Um, but my friend told me a story one time. He went to a cottage out in Muskoka. It was a, a buddy's dad's cottage. And he went there and the place had like an outdoor pool, a couple of tennis courts, outdoor basketball court. Obviously, it was on the lake, one of the Muskoka lakes. I forget which one it was. And then it was this mansion of a, a property. Huge place. And one night, my buddy was sitting with the guy's dad at the fire. And he said, you know, Mr. X, I won't say the name. Um, I really appreciate you having me here. It's always so much fun. I, I, I love coming up here. And I just really, really appreciate it. And the dad looked at the, my buddy and he said, you know what? Without friends and family to share it with, it's just brick and mortar. And I'll never forget that story because it just goes to show you we're on this pursuit. We have our whys and our whys is why we keep going. I have a son on the way, super excited. And it's a whole new reason for me to continue doing this stuff because every day there's a deeper meaning behind it. it it's not about getting rich and, and having bank accounts full of money because it, it's really worthless. It's about time, spending it with family, spending it with friends and living the life we want to live. And I, and I think everyone can, can achieve that dream. We've talked to so many different people at this point. And honestly, you can tell people who are in it for the money and people who are in it for a deeper why. You have the deeper why. And I think a lot of people who are listening will resonate with that and will definitely want to speak with you. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, please do. Please do. And uh, I, thanks again for having me on. This was, this was a lot of fun. I hope we can do it again soon and uh, talk more about uh, sports and real estate and life and people and everything that's uh, that's beautiful about this world so thanks guys it, it